you for joining us for this episode of Inside Town Hall. I'm your host, Madeline Shields. Public safety is always on the top of people's minds, and that is what we are starting the show off with this, this time. Joining me is City Councilor David Barranco, and his guest is Police Chief John Toom, and Fire Chief Matt McElravey. Thank you for joining us. Let's talk about public safety. Everybody always wants to know what's happening in the police the police department and the fire department. Let's let's start off with your perspective from the city council. Well, since being elected, uh, public safety has actually risen to become my number one issue, my number one priority. And I think it's also number one for a lot of our residents. So it's been a great honor to work with these two gentlemen, uh, learn about what they're doing, and I'm very impressed by a lot of the uh, things that they've achieved. Of course, I think we've got excellent um, leaders here, and I think we've got excellent departments, but I think it's the obligation of city government and the city council to press to improve, no matter um, there's always room to do a better job, and so it's, it's been really rewarding and gratifying to work with both of them, finding ways to uh, serve the citizens even better. Um, just for example, we were uh, just discussing the new center where a lot of our first responders are going to have the opportunity to be trained, which I think is a, a phenomenal asset for not only for the city, but actually for the state as a whole. Sure, let's talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, the public safety campus update. We've been talking about that for a couple of years and it's super exciting and I know that's, uh, Metro is moving there as well. Um, who wants to go first? Let's talk about that. I always updates. defer to Chief McAravey first okay. on those ones. So. <laughs> All right, yeah, you know, I would actually reach back further. It's been almost a decade in the works for this facility, so we've identified the need and uh, just the facility that we've outgrown out at the present airport grounds, so very excited. We're uh, working to get that one across the, the finish line this uh, fall and take over. You know, there's a total of over 100 acres is uh, city property out there. There's 42 acres that's currently under construction uh, in total a $55 million campus and really is going to elevate public safety, like you said, uh, not only in the city but in the entire region. Very excited about that and it just speaks volumes to the, the, the council, the administration, and the community's support of public safety. Yeah, I, I can echo that. And really, if you think back to the time that that was finalized, it was during 2020 when there was a lot of conversations about defunding public safety, shifting resources and allocations other places. And really, our mayor's office, our city council, our community, they didn't really fall into that. They looked at it. Here's what we need to have the best training, most, most professional, either police department or fire department, and really make that investment. And because of that smart investment, when we saw price escalations and things get really, really goofy in the building market, we were in a stable, sound position to build what we needed, how we needed it to really augment and really grow our training into this, into the future. And I would add that if we attempted, if we had waited and attempted to build an equal facility later than when we pulled the trigger on that, um, we would have been hit with much more costs. So I think that it was really wise and really prudent that we made the investment when we did, and I'm very excited for the way that's going to pay off for everybody in the community. And I'm sure the employees are ecstatic about this new facility, and it's, it looks like um, this fall it, it will yeah. be opening. Um, will you be doing tours to the public, or how, how will people get to, to see the new we're, facility? We're in the process now of working through to uh, really make sure that this is a community-wide event. This is a community asset. One of the exciting parts for our teams is that we're going to be able to have the community out at that ground. So our present training center is out on the airport grounds, like I said, so you have to go through all the security protocols with being next to a runway. So very excited that we're going to be able to, com to uh, include the community now in uh, some of those different things. So it will be a community-wide event. There's just a tremendous amount of excitement. And one area that we kind of left off in that first part, you had mentioned that Metro 911 will be moving out there, and we're very excited for those employees. So they've been down in the uh, public safety building presently and, uh, and have been without windows for far too long. So <laughs> we're excited to get them out there in a new space and really uh, improve the workspace for that entire team. Yeah, and it's, it's one thing to see videos and pictures and concepts and plans which a lot of our employees have seen, but not a lot of them had the, uh, had the opportunity to actually walk on the grounds. And I know for us, when, every time we walk out there, it just brings a new level of excitement and just appreciation for what this facility is and what it's going to do for our community and for our employees. Sure. Well, let's talk about the cost and, and the budget. Um, and that's what people always want to know. Well, you know, it's great that we have it. Where, where do we get the funding? Well, the, the cost is substantial. I want to uh, recognize that 
you know, there are a lot of um, hardworking people in our community that are, um, you know, alert to the fact that this isn't um, cheap. But at the same time, I think that if there's one item that there's a consensus that we need to make the investment in, it's public safety, whether that's um, the training facility, but you know, we would just have the honor of bringing in a new class of police officers. And um, last year, one of the reasons that um, the chief was so successful this year in bringing in that great class is because uh, the mayor and the council really, uh, I think, unified behind the idea that we need to give our first responders um, these valiant men and women that protect us all the resources they need to make sure we can debate other um, expenditures made by the city. I, I'm, I'm very open to that debate, but in this regard, we want to. We have a, a consensus, and we definitely have a, a, a unifying principle that we want all of our men and women, all of the children in this community, to be safe. And we need to make the investment necessary to guarantee that that's the case. Yeah, and we are good stewards of our resources. I think it's also worth noting that the previous facility is about as old as me, uh, about 43 <laughs> years old, was built about the same time, and so we were able to maximize and use that facility beyond actually its useful life and we have the same intention with this facility and this ground and this investment to really be a good steward of that resource and that trust that the public's given us and the financial expense and really maximize that for years to come. And does does this show like your new recruits? Everybody is always we're always talking about workforce development and trying to get people to come to Sioux Falls um, not only to um, live here to work here to play here. Um, this shows a commitment to those new folks who are coming to this area. Um, talk a little bit about why that is so important as well. Yeah, I think it really, again, we go back to kind of some of the nationwide conversation about how uh, investments should be made in public safety. And I think that you saw a pause and a lapse at many points. And I think when we talk to people who are looking at us as pers prospective applicants, one of the first things they notice is they're not, I mean, they're looked at the department, but they're really looked at the community and the community support. And I think there's no better symbol of community support than to make that investment. And then you start piggybacking on the other things we can show them about how the community supports us and has our backs. And it really paints a picture of who Sioux Falls is. And that's really a, 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 a welcoming environment for public safety. And that's a great recruiting tool. And I'd like to add I, I'm, one project in particular I'm excited about, we've discussed it, are the report to work stations. Um, that's going to enable our officers to um, get on station faster. But I think it's also a very public symbol of our commitment to the safety in the community. And um, there's going to, it is envisioned that there will be a, a report to work station both southwest and southeast. And, um, Although uh, we're attempting to be good stewards of our resources, I'm absolutely eager to explore ways of trying to bring forward um, to get those uh, centers built at the right cost, but also uh, more quickly where we can begin enjoying those benefits sooner. Yeah, for sure. And if you look at, we already have a Southwest report to workstation, which has been covered. Fire has this uh, unique model and setup that's different than police, where all these fire stations are scattered around town. But if you were looking for a police presence, it's really centrally located. And now we have the ability as the city grows and expands, in particular to the southeast, we have some land that's already been earmarked by 41st and Faith next to fire station. I never remember the 12. number. 12. I don't know the numbers. I just know where they're at, right? <laughs> and so, but we want to look in the future where we partner with fire to say, how can we have a city Absolutely. footprint at some of these different locations? And really, uh, I think it's a message to our our residents that you know the city remembers you're here mm -hmm. as we kind of sprawl and that we have a presence in public safety there for folks who don't remember what is a, a report to work station sure um, our original building you know was built around around 2000 and we've seen rapid growth uh, within Sioux Falls and that obviously has produced more and more officers more and more employees uh, it doesn't quite make sense to build a brand new precinct or police station but we have his report to work where officers can report to that location for their day, get in their car and go out on their shift uh, at that location in town. Uh, like I said, a police officer's office is their squad car, right? Uh, they don't necessarily need the physical location, but they need a location to go to, report, and then go out. But what we envision for the future, in particular Southeast, is that there's a forward-facing element and that we build uh, structures that we can grow into. Now, it may not be a full precinct someday, but there may be a front desk or detective's offices. It has the ability to kind of become more forward facing and develop as the community grows. So we want to build not only with a footprint for now, but a footprint for the future on these new locations. I had heard at some point that there would be places where you could drop off like um, evidence or something yeah. and that, that would that would prevent having to drive all yep. the way to, across town. Yeah, our Southwest Reports work already 
has that evidence mm -hmm. drop off, the Southeast would have. And we also look for in the future, because we're making decisions now that are after we're gone. Right, so what's that Northwest growth area? What's that industrial area? What's that residential gonna push in that Northwest? We might have an eye to those, there's those areas too, because the reality is at certain parts of Sioux Falls, I can get to Canton quicker than I can get across town now. Mm -hmm. right? Right. So we just, as our city grows and sprawls, our, our road networks, we have to just be able to have uh, efficiency in our movement. Okay. Let's talk about the equipment that you need um, as you move forward. We, you, police cars, squad cars, new fire trucks. Can we talk a little bit about you know what we're envisioning um, for 2024? Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I think, uh, uh, speaking for all of us, when I say that the council has more than once um, directly asked, what, what do you need? What can we provide to make sure that you can do your jobs? And um, I think we've got some um, very uh, empowering equipment kind of already purchased, but also some in the pipeline. And I'd love to hear more about that. Absolutely. The entire city team works together, whether it's finance, fleet, uh, IT, maintenance, all those work together to really identify what's most efficient, efficient for deployment of our resources. And then that's built right into that capital plan. There's a tremendous amount of legwork that goes into forecasting. What do we need for vehicles, fire trucks, stations, land, all of that, and is laid out in the entire capital plan that goes out every year. So it's a very streamlined process. It's neat to see it works well and really helps us make sure that we're able to to identify and forecast so that we can see any pitfalls ahead and hopefully plan for that. Um, this next year coming up, for instance, we have a, a fire engine that's coming in, a ladder truck that, you know, with escalations and everything, those are over a million dollar vehicle these days. So it's an absolute significant investment for our community. We work together with our partners to identify how do we make sure that we maximize utilization of that while minimizing where we don't need to use it so that we can extend the lifetime of that and working very closely with our, our partners in fleet and finance on that. Well, and I was going to say, you were kind enough to give me a tour of, I guess, our city's oldest standing, and maybe yep. even you said it's the second oldest still standing, still west, operating, still yep. operating west yep. of the Mississippi. And um, it was amazing to see the the change. And you know, in, within that uh, facility, there are still some of the older horse-drawn uh, fire pumps from uh, another age. Yep. And you know, to compare those with the incredibly effective modern technology that we're using now, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's pretty humbling to think that over 100 years ago they had the foresight to build a station that today still houses one of our largest apparatus. So sure. they really took the time to build for the future, you know, and I look, we all like to be good stewards of city dollars, and there's a lot of instances there where maybe taking shortcuts now don't necessarily pay dividends in the future. So we like to be cognizant of that, like make sure that we're being good stewards with what we presently have. There's a lot of uh, intentional forecasting that goes into our facilities. How do we make sure that we maintain those while providing for those next stations as well? Yeah, and you know, as police, we're not as uh, heavy equipment heavy. I mean, like I said, I see a fire truck and that's an expensive <laughs> thing. Our patrol cars are expensive and we need more and more of them. Uh, technology in the patrol cars is amazing. I think if you ever had a chance to look in one, it really is. Uh, I mean, it's so technologically advanced, we need special staff just to help us keep them running and keep them going. But the privilege that I have is we just had National Night Out uh, a couple weeks ago, and that's so we get the chance to go out and interact with the community. And a lot of times uh, residents come up to me and like, well, what can we do? What do you need better to do your job? How can we support you in doing your job? And I'm like, to be honest, under this administration and this council, we have the tools that we need an unwavering support. Uh, I think sometimes people think that they need to go kind of get to hold their city council and say, why aren't you funding this or doing this? And I'm like, no, that's not the case. I can go out there and, and tell open and honest that we have great communication, great support. What we need is just more people willing to do our job. And that's the nationwide story right now when it comes to law enforcement, but it also is with nursing and teaching right. and other industries. We've kind of spent the past couple of years beating up a few industries, and now we're wondering why there's young people that don't want to do the job, right? <laughs> so it's kind of you know, pendulums ebb and flow. I mean, they go back and forth, things flow, and what we need, and I think what we want to do is just work together with the community to say, we want you on our department. We uh, support you in your adventure to, to be, join our team and just keep that messaging across the board, whether it's city council, whether it's the mayor's office, whether it's the departments, but it also comes from the community, the community bringing up people that say, yeah, we want that person on your team. So, And isn't it the case that we now provide even more scholarship opportunities yeah. in some of our local 
Yeah, this is a new program, and like we're still in the groundwork of it. It's called the Cadet Academy, where we have three people who are um, receiving some funding from uh, Sioux Falls Development Foundation through Southeast Technical College and mentorship through our department, other support, where there are pilot projects to kind of get into that law enforcement program and they have to apply and be selected, pass a background, but they're people who maybe wouldn't have had the chance to have right. a traditional education. Mm -hmm. But now we want to highlight and partner with Southeast Technical mm -hmm. College and other, and other groups to really push this forward and create a new pipeline towards public safety. Exactly. And like any pilot program, we'll, we'll have education, we'll yeah. learn from it, but I am very, very optimistic that this could yeah. be uh, instrumental to future force development. And again, too, we may end up with an 18-year-old who thinks they want to be an officer, but by the time they're done, Maybe they don't want to do that anymore, right. but maybe they want to be a firefighter, or maybe they want to work in a different part of city government. And we want them to kind of get familiar. We've seen it with our internship program uh, citywide. Once we get people into this, the city government structure, they're like, yeah, I want to work for that city. I, I like their mission. I like the way they, they, they do, go about their business, and I like the people. And I think that's what we want to just create pipelines that people see us mm -hmm. as a great employer. And the city has also made a commitment to people who work in law enforcement um, and public safety to um, get them to move into the core areas of the city. I, I don't know if you know information about that, but um, with low interest mm -hmm. um, home loans and, and incentives, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm very that? excited about that program. We have, um, and it probably is more detailed than maybe want in this forum, but mm -hmm. I encourage um, people to come and learn about this. We're trying to create a situation where we have first responders living, you know, in these neighborhoods where they're most needed, and um, you know, creating a way to make that happen. And there's even been some discussion. You talked about other professions that we're in need of, such as nurses in particular, to maybe expand some of that to other um, incredibly, you know, we just a couple years ago we learned how much we rely on nurses as well and so maybe that's an idea that could even uh, have legs to grow sure well great well it's always a, a pleasure visiting with both of you uh, what is one thing that you would like the public to know that when you guys are working what what can they do you know if there's a fire truck coming if there's a police car coming up behind them well I mean for a police standpoint I think sometimes I joke that you know, especially during a couple of years, 2020, we got a lot of mean things said to us, <laughs> maybe obscene <laughs> gestures and rocks thrown at us. But even during that period of time when there was kind of uh, some anti-police sentiment, the positive words of encouragement, the thumbs up as we drove by, people buying us random cups of coffee or lunch was far exceeded the negativity. And I think if we keep that up, again, just a quick word of encouragement or a thumbs up uh, goes a long way. And I think, again, our, our department knows the community has our back. Sure. Absolutely. Follow, uh, we always uh, encourage people to follow the rules of the road, right? Move to the right when you see lights. It is imperative. Uh, we have really good resources that are prepared to get there and, and perform their job, but they need to be able to get through in traffic. And uh, between construction and snow and just normal driving habits, that is imperative. So keep enforcing that. Be a good, uh, good rule follower and uh, set an example there. Helps us get to where we need to be. All right. Well, thank you both for, for joining us. And, Thanks for um, having us. Yes, and Councillor Barranco and I will be right back. Uh, when we come back, we're going to meet our new city clerk. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Dr. Cooper from Falls Community Health, and I'm here to talk to you about sun protection. First, I have a joke. What do you call a sunburn librarian? Well read. Sunscreen use can help prevent skin cancer, which is estimated to affect one in five Americans. You should use sunscreen that offers the following, broad spectrum protection, SPF 30 or higher, and water resistance. Do this even on cloudy days when up to 80% of the sun's rays can penetrate the clouds. Skin cancer is no joke. If you have any questions about sun protection or other things this summer, please contact your doctor or Falls Community Health. Welcome back to Inside Town Hall. Running city government can be complicated and there is a lot that goes on to organize elections, city council meetings and notifications to make sure that the public is informed. And joining me again is our um, city councilor, David Barranco, and his guest is Jeremy Washington, who is our new city clerk. Welcome to the city of Sioux Falls and thank to you. Sioux Falls. Um, thank you for joining us for this episode. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, taking the position and, and advertising for the position of city clerk. 
Well, um, as you know, we uh, had our city clerk who went to go work for the county, and he was a, a terrific, terrific guy. So we had quite a challenge to try to find somebody to fill those shoes, and um, it was a team effort. You know, the council formed a committee. We um, got a lot of resumes, but we are overjoyed that we found somebody who is so experienced, so capable, and so positive to come and join our team, because as you stated, it is an incredibly important job. Um, you know, not only the uh, notifications and the administration of, of city services, but um, we've got coming up in uh, April, um, you know, some elections. And um, if we've learned anything over the last five years, we've learned that elections need to be administered in an effective and an impartial and an accurate way. And I'm absolutely thrilled that we've got somebody that's going to do a great job with All that. Right. Well, Mr. Washington, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first thing, of course, I am from the South, and I love the fish, so if anybody ever sees me out in the pub, you're probably going to see a fishing pole in my hand or a <laughs> grocery shop or something like that. Um, I do have a pretty good sense of humor. I, uh, yeah, I like... I do like a little bit of sports. I used to be real, be real big into football, and uh, being from Alabama, of course, we have the SEC and the ACC. I, I am an Auburn fan, and if anybody remembers uh, 20... In the mid 2010s, uh, where Alabama played Texas, mm. I was faced with a dilemma. <laughs> I said, who do I who do I root for here? <laughs> I'm not going to say who I root okay, for. Okay, well, we'll give you that choice. Yeah. <laughs> well, Alabama and Texas are going to play here in about a month, so I may come and, and see whether I can re recruit you to recruit for the Longhorns. Then, but All right. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about you have uh, experience as a, a city clerk, and mm -hmm. you know what? I guess why Sioux Falls? What was uh, what was the appeal to come here and, and to take this position? And oh, this may be a surprise or it may not be, but my wife's a pickleball player. Oh. So that <laughs> had a lot to do with it. <laughs> and I've heard there's a lot of good restaurants here too, and I love to eat. So that's another, another one of the factors. And I did talk with Tom Greco before, and this is a really great team, really good council, good, good citizens out here. So it was it's perfect for us to uh, make the move out here. So, okay. And if I could jump in to everybody who's watching, we definitely need recommendations on uh, where our new city clerk can go out to eat and also <laughs> great places where he can fish. You know, you got, you got two southerners here. We don't necessarily know all the great places in this state where somebody could go fishing, so I'm excited. For it. Please bring that information down to Carnegie. <laughs> well, great. Let's talk a little bit about um, the position as city clerk. Um, you have experience doing this um, you know what are some some of the the challenges that go into the job I venture to guess a lot of people um, citizens really don't know what a city clerk is or what a city clerk does so uh, enlighten us a little bit well first thing I would say is there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about even city and other city employees don't see these things it's a constant battle of the city clerk's department trying to keep everything on schedule, getting things published. It's deadline after deadline, but the, the two assistant city clerks that we have here, they're doing a fantastic job at it. And I tell them almost every day, it's like, you guys have made it very easy for me to come over here and catch on to, to what you're doing. But yeah, there, it, it is a lot of work, but we, we do it every day, so. Sure, and one thing um, people might not know, if there's a city council meeting, mm -hmm. um, the, the public must be notified, and that right. must be through like either newspapers, mm -hmm. um, um, online, um, television, however, there has to be notifications, so that if folks wanna come and attend those meetings, that they have ample time to do that. So those are the deadlines that you're talking about. Right, um, some of those, and in, then uh, in notices of, of hearings and other things and, like that. So. And then talk about um, putting up an election and how when when there's a city council election, um, how the city clerk, what's what goes into organizing that election, making mm -hmm. sure uh, you work with all the polls. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, elections, those, those are really big. Um, our election's coming up in April, so don't be surprised if you see us getting ready here in a couple of weeks. So <laughs> we have to be well in advance. We have to start preparing for that. So we have to get uh, poll workers recruited and train them and then the, there yeah, are so many notices that we have to get out to the public and the, the precincts. We, I know Lincoln County has just added some precincts, so we got to get that, get that uh, spun up and going too. So yeah, lots of work. 
Right, you've spanned, um, this position spans two counties because mm -hmm. the city of Sioux Falls, um, that's always confusing to many people that, you know, the city is, of Sioux Falls um, spans mm -hmm. in Minnehaha County and Lincoln County. So there's a lot going on um, in terms of, of notifications and deadlines. Um, um, what, you know, talk about your team. I know you, you've only been there a couple of weeks, but um, talk about the team that you're working with and, and how um, you proceed um, starting all of these new procedures. Oh yeah, Tamara and Denise, they're, they're fantastic assistants, so I couldn't do anything without them. So they, they are well versed, they, their knowledge is, yeah, it's, it, it's up there. So if I, every day I have questions for them and they, there's no hesitation for them to answer my questions. So I have no doubt that we'll be able to get through this election with ease. I say with ease, but elections are tough, but with this team of people here, we'll get through it. Well, and if I could add, one of the things that we specifically sought was someone who has experience um, working with counties because we knew that was be integral to what we're trying to achieve. So um, in Mr. Washington's background, he uh, specifically talked about how he's had some experience. Um, in fact, coming into um, your previous job, you had inherited a situation where there wasn't necessarily the most uh, cooperation between oh. city and county mm -hmm. and thanks to your positivity and your hard work mm -hmm. um, you bridge that gap mm -hmm. and I, I loved hearing that I, I know that we have um, a better relationship with Minnehaha and Lincoln but of course we always want to be cognizant mm -hmm. of the fact that that linking up those um, county and city functions in an election is not something that will happen automatically it needs to be intentional and I'm mm -hmm. glad we've got the right guy to make that happen Sure, and um, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about um, bridging those gaps and and working together. And why is that so important when you are um, a city clerk and you're working with the city council? And there's a lot of different um, things going on with city councilors, and there's a lot of different opinions on how things need to go. Um, can you talk a little bit about how? how it is to work with people with all different personalities coming from different perspectives. Yeah, yeah the, the teamwork thing, I won't go into too many details about what happened over there, but I was struggling trying to find poll workers for my first election out there, and I didn't know where to turn. So I contacted the county, and there wasn't as good as communication there as I wanted, but something had happened to where they had we don't do the county elections, but our the city hall was a polling place for the county elections. So when the poll workers came out that day, I met them, I greeted them, even though they weren't my poll workers. I started building a good rapport with them, and I asked them, I said, hey, do you guys want better chairs to sit in? Because you're going to be sitting in these chairs for 12, 14 hours, and they were the, the folding plastic chairs. So I went and got our comfortable chairs out of our conference room. I said, hey, you guys want these chairs instead? And that's where it started. So now we have a real good open, well, I say we, but Box Elder has a really good open <laughs> relationship with both counties now because of that work that I've done to kind of bridge that gap with them. And with the, the county auditors and the election superintendent over there, we, we all, we talk all the time and so, yeah. And you're bringing that kind of um, perspective and, and um, I guess attitude to to this position here in Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep, yeah. ready to get the work on it, so. All right. <laughs> and I, I'd like to say, you know, it, sometimes it's a small thing. Sometimes it's a, just a gesture of being compassionate towards someone else and recognizing, you know, having in your heart the idea that, hey, maybe they'd be more comfortable if I got them some better chairs. In the grand scheme of the universe, we can, we can survive a, an un uncomfortable chair. Yeah. But the fact that someone cares enough to make that offer, yeah, I think sends a strong signal that we're all coming from the same place, that we're all uh, working with a good heart and trying to accomplish a common goal. It's always the little things. It's not the big things that get to people. And that's that's across the board, yes, <laughs> I think, everywhere. <laughs> well, we appreciate your time here today. And welcome to Sioux Falls. And um, we will definitely be hearing more from you in the future as we uh, continue on with Inside Town Hall. And um, we'll have you back as a guest as, when you uh, have a little bit more um, experience in your position. Oh, yes. So, well, welcome and we're happy you're here. All right, thank you so right. much. Well, that is our time. If you have any uh, questions or concerns or you're just looking for more information, you can always get that right at SiouxFalls.org. Thanks for watching.